Welcome everyone to the John Gardena classroom. I'm very, very blessed today to have a special guest and co-author as well. Um, his name is Chris Michelle. He has been in the sales, or I'm sorry, in the business of HVAC for, for 30 years. Um, recently, he's been doing sales and, and business as a coach. Um, he just, he knows his way around the land and what I love about him and he, he does not know this yet because I did not tell him, but my whole, my whole family is from the trades. So my dad is a maintenance manager. So you talk about HVAC, plumbing, construction, all that stuff. You know, he's got it down pat. My uncle, same thing, master, just craftsman. And my, my, my mom's side, you know, we have a electric, a electrical background. And then my brother, he's an electrical engineer. So, you know, I've done projects at my house, my family's houses. So um, I'm very well versed in what you um, have to experience with people and business and parts. And it's not an easy job. But Chris, the, the one thing that I know for you um, recently is um, besides your background and knowledge in HVAC um, and all the experience you have in, in sales and just your your repertoire of a person that you've built um, with other people is that you've recently uh, written a book. It's right here. You graciously had given me a copy and I began reading it right away. Um, it's a day-to-day -day book. Um, I'll, let, I'll let Chris talk more about it in detail, but I'll tell you just my experience thus far. Uh, it has been um, very comforting uh, I started on the day, I think just a couple of days ago. So today's the 24th of April. Uh, I got it in over, I think this weekend. So I just started it on 21st or 22nd. You know, what I love about the book is it's very intimate about your experiences in life and what you can offer to people in their journey um, day to day. And I love devotionals. I just written one. Um, I'm reading Paul Gray's um, notes um, from Papa. It's a great book. And I've always um, just loved the mornings to, to pray, to meditate, to reflect and have a vision for the day. And this is just a nice piece to add to my collection and to experience. Um, I don't have a red chair. I have a very similar, <laughs> style, that, that's very foreign style, a very, um, I guess, artsy style chair, not a red leather chair that you would see um, more of a, um, let's see, a past experience with maybe with a psychologist sitting down right and you'll tell the story when we get there but Chris um, it's just a pleasure to have you on and um, just to uh, tell a little bit about yourself and, and kind of expand on what I what I spoke upon if you don't mind right. well thank you John for having me first of all and uh, really appreciate it I am in fact sitting in the red chair so this is the chair that's pictured on the front of the book and by the way the picture is the real red chair nice. um so a number of things uh, I've been, you hinted at it. I've been around sales for over 30 years. I've been in the HVAC industry around plumbing, electrical, all that for the last 18 years. And I've had opportunity to be in sales and management and all of that good stuff. And, you know, a few years ago, decided to write a book. And here we are. I mean, two years later, it's literally almost to the day. It's almost two years later. So since, since you began writing or since you published it? Since no, 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 since I started, I just published started, it. Right? Um, yeah, it just came out um, a week ago. Um, so it's it's getting ready to hit Amazon on the 26th. So, okay, so uh, this is great. My, my book, um, Freedom to Ascend, just came out this past yep. week on the 19th. And, uh, you know, it's really cool when it, it goes on Amazon, is you feel like you are established then because you tell <laughs> people, like, hey, you can buy my book for me. And they're like, is it on Amazon? And they're like, not yet. And you're like, well, I don't know if I believe this guy that he's really an author yet. Right. <laughs> you got well, yeah. And there's that. that, there is that mystique. It's really weird because it's like, well, you can get an autographed copy from me. They're like, um, but I can't get it from Amazon yet. No, not yet. And you won't get, you know, you won't be able to get an autographed copy through Amazon either. So, yeah, but yeah, they'll have that opportunity on Tuesday. Um, kind of like what you, you know, what you did with yours. It's, it's just a week after yours. And so, I'm looking forward to that. Actually, I have a number of people that I know overseas that, or, or in Canada or, you know, in different countries that it's quite frankly, it's a whole lot cheaper for them to get it from Amazon than it is for yeah. me. So that, uh, I, the, 
the LinkedIn will go out tomorrow and the, and the Facebook and all that stuff will go out tomorrow. Hey, you know, check it out. So I will be more than happy to um, release this as soon as I can. So people <laughs> know that it's on Amazon and um, all the other major websites as well to buy. Um, but before we get into the book, Chris, I really want to get into like to know you more. Uh, so if you can just talk about your upbringing, what, where, where you were born, what kind of family life you lived, and um, just kind of go into some details in that respect. Sure. Um, I was born. No, I'm kidding. Um, I, I grew up outside of Chicago mm -hmm. in a town called St. Charles, Illinois. And I was I lived there till I was 18, went to the University of Illinois for college. And I was a walk on, on the University of Illinois football team. And I played four years there and lettered. Never got a scholarship, but that was okay. I still, I, I have the letterman's jacket literally right in the closet. So, um, but that was a really cool experience. And then I moved to St. Louis, lived there for a number of years, moved to Atlanta in 2001, just before 9-11. And I actually moved over to Memphis in 2008 and then moved back to Atlanta in 2012. And I've been here ever since. So back here for 10 years, so. So, man, so you grew up, so you grew up outside of Chicago, correct? Correct. About 40 miles west of the city in, like I said, in a town called St. Charles, Illinois. And I grew up, I grew up in a single parent household and uh, a lot of that gets revealed in the, in the book. But if you know me, you can know the story already, but um, my parents got divorced when I was young. And so we grew up with my dad. So it was my younger brother, my older brother, and we're all about two years apart and my dad. And so it was an interesting life, right? I mean, we, we kind of grew up in a time and in a place where um, emotions and affections weren't really shared. And so that wasn't something, you know, touchy feely was not something I did very well. And I, it took me a while to learn that. And I hopefully have learned it well enough to, I get to pass it on to my kids, right? My kids are older now, 22 and 26. And so it's, it's just a, a little bit different now and a, a, just a different time, a different place. But I grew up in that situation. My dad owned his own landscape company. So I grew up, if you will, around the trades as well. Mm -hmm. And I landscaped for, you know, the first 12 years, seven to 19. I mean, I was working for him when I was seven and stopped working for him when I was 19, when I could finally get away to college Yeah, <laughs> and go on. So but it taught me a lot. I mean, it really taught me a lot about work ethic and, and how to deal with people. And I learned Spanish, you know, working with my dad and, and some of the folks that came to work with us at that time. So it was yeah. a really great experience. You know, it's, it's so funny that you said that about landscaping, because uh, I've been landscaping for somebody since I think 19. So when you, <laughs> when you wanted to get out, when I dropped off, you picked up, Good I job. Picked it up. So 19, I was, I worked at my former school which I work currently at as a teacher but while I was in college I was living at home my first year after um, I got out of my freshman year for summer just summer only mm -hmm. and then I got back and then I worked at the grounds crew for John Carroll where I went to school and then a couple of years go by and I've been working at a golf course for 13 years which was my first day back wow. today so I've I don't I there's a piece about it so landscaping mm -hmm. and the one thing i've learned is being around people all the time as a teacher you know author public you know all this uh, podcast or all this stuff is it's nice to just get away from people i don't mean that negatively i just mean yeah. it's a reflection period sure and in hard work and I, I love working with my hands it gives you some satisfaction that you you know you accomplish something so i think probably I'm not trying to put words in your mouth here, but I, I feel like you witnessing your dad and his business and you being around the business probably helped develop and set the table for you becoming a, a business uh, man yourself. Would you agree with that? Yeah. In fact, it was funny because I was having this conversation with somebody the other day. I, I've worked in corporate America for 30 plus years. Yeah. And it wasn't until about a year and a half ago that I started my own company. But when I was in my 20s, I actually went to an interview and both of my parents owned their own company. Um, my mom and dad each, each had their own separate businesses, were entrepreneurs. And this is back in the 70s and 80s, right? So it, it took a, a while for me. But when I interviewed at this, you know, when I was 20 something, 
I, I said to the interviewer, I said, yeah, both my parents own their own business. And he looked at me and he goes, so how do I know you're not going to start your own business? How do I know you're not going to leave me and start your own business? And I thought at the time I was like, oh crap, I just put my foot in my mouth. I have no desire to start my own business, right? I have no desire to own my own business. Yeah. But that's the funny thing that, that he heard, what he heard was, oh, this guy may leave me. And I think how short-sighted, right? That we would do that. We do that to somebody and say, oh, your parents are entrepreneurs. You must be an entrepreneur. Yeah. And maybe I didn't like it, you know, and cause I didn't, I didn't, I watched my dad growing up and I watched my, you know, the things that happened and, and how he was sometimes living paycheck to paycheck. Right. And, and it, it's still one of those things It's feast or famine. Right. And, you know, landscaping, I mean, it's, it's, there's a high season and a low season and the high season is you better learn how to make money and save it and put it all away. And so, yeah, I got to watch all that stuff growing up. So I, I really had no desire to own my own business for the longest time because uh, of that. You, it was, I mean, man, what a, it's so great to have that knowledge and wisdom mm -hmm. of seeing both parents have their own business and in landscaping where, where, where you used to live by the great lakes and you only have like six months to, to get it done because right. then it's either you're plowing driveways with snow or mm -hmm. you're trying to figure something out during the winter months to survive. And you, you seeing that you said, no way do I want to be a part of that. Right. I want to, I want to have a, Nice four hundred one k. Like to have a steady job and yeah, all these other things. Yeah, yeah. So. yeah, that's exactly what it was. Though it was really, it was really interesting time, you know. And and being able to again, I learned so many things when I was younger, and and got to see the good and the bad. Right, you get to see the the prosperity, but you also get to see the downside. And and the again, the feast or famine type of stuff. And entrepreneurship can be like that, but. Once you learn the, the business, once you learn how to, you know, do all those things, you can overcome that stuff just by having a proper plan in place, right? And having the right people in your vault involved in your life and helping you out and that kind of stuff. So, yeah. So then you went, you went to college, you were walking. Let's talk a little bit about that experience that you had. So you're a big, tough guy. You come in there like, you know what? I'm just going to, it'll be easy to make the team. Probably not. Mm -hmm. No, I did not. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I did not. Well, you know, it's really interesting because um, Harry and I talked about this, you know, Harry Spate. Yeah. Harry and I were talking about this the other day and, and he was asking questions that he never knew. He's like, he's known me for over a year now. And he's like, this is a whole new side. I never got to see this. And it was about the football stuff. Cause I don't, I don't generally talk a lot about the football stuff. And it's not that I'm ashamed of it. I love that particular part of my life. And it's an experience that nobody can take away from me. I got to do something that very few people do. I was looking at a statistic the other day. There was a, a board. How many, how many kids go and play high school football? And then how many kids turn around and play college football? And then how many kids go on to play pro football, right? And it, the statistics are just amazing to look at. It's, it was like three or three and a half percent go from high school to college and 1%, or less than 1% go from high, or college to pro. Mm -hmm. And so I never went pro and, and had, I didn't have the abilities to do that. Um, but I, I have a number of friends that were able to do that and, and did very well, very successful at it. And I, watched, I got to watch them from afar. But when I went to the university, I had no, um, I, I didn't have any, predispositions in my head, right? I wasn't, I wasn't like, oh my gosh, I'm going to be this big, awesome guy. I was a standout at my high school, but we went winless our senior year. Mm. And there was a number of reasons why. Personally, I got injured that year. We had a, a top running back, Mike, he got injured that year. I mean, we had several injuries that happened and just all the things that should have come together. I mean, we were, we had 11 starters that were returned from our junior to our senior year, right? I was starting both ways my senior year yeah. and others like that, right? I mean, I think seven or eight of us were returning starters both ways. And so we had a really good core and a really good team and, and something happened, right? Something fell apart. And so I'm kind of limping off of that. In fact, um, one of the stories that I shared was my high school coach at the end of the year, we had this sit down conversation, you know, what do you want to do? Where do you want to go? And I said, I want to play big 10 football. And he goes, that's not going to happen. Hmm. And I went, watch me. 
you know, it's one of those hold my beer, right? It's, it's, the, yeah. it's that conversation where you go, hang on a second. I'm now I've got something to prove. And if for nothing else, it was to prove to myself that I could do it. I walk onto the university of Illinois and number one, uh, the, the starting tight end at the time is a guy named Cap Boso outstanding guy goes on to play professional football. The number one recruit, uh, tight end recruit in the, in the, um, nation a guy named Anthony Williams, guess where he goes to play university of Illinois. Right. And Illinois was really good at the time. Mike White was the coach really, really good at the time of recruiting from junior colleges. So then they bring in this guy from, uh, Jerry Reese from the, uh, from California, mm -hmm. outstanding tight end. Right. And, um, they've got another guy, Mark, who, um, was, he was kind of a flex back. So he was a tight end halfback kind of flex player. Right. And so I'm like way down on the totem pole. <laughs> and so, yeah. and, you know, and, and so I was I really was happy to be on the team and, and to be able to contribute to the team and, and do the things that I did. And like I said, I lettered. So yeah, it was on special teams and I played three downs at tight end, but I had a really good time. And, and again, it's something that I did that you can't take that away from me. There's, you can't remove that experience and say, no, that didn't happen. Well, you know, the nice thing is, is, you know, I played college baseball, not D1, but I think the biggest thing that I learned and very probably similar to you is it's about grit. It's about, you know, going against the odds. And I was always just, I'm not a big guy. And being a pitcher at five, nine, people look at you and be like, holy macros. Um, but I was blessed when I, I had a really good junior year and I pitched against the number one team in the nation, Marietta. And um pitched almost a complete game it was almost nine innings we did a nine inning game instead of seven that's what wow. we played yeah and I, I went I think eight and a third and I had like 10 strikeouts and it was just an amazing feat and I thought to myself like, you know what just because you look at like the old Rudy thing like you know don't, mm -hmm. don't judge me by my size yeah it can be effective and that's you know that's what we all need to understand is you don't you don't have to look the part you know, yeah. you to look the part and, and we're going to get into your book here in a second, right before we do our recess. But, you know, one thing I've I learned from in, it's just in life is that the experience of going through that adversity mm -hmm. and it, it makes you or breaks you. And a lot of people don't know how to handle setbacks or struggles mm -hmm. and they, they let that define them. And they can't really recoup from them for some reason. You know, basically, if you look at the pandemic, a lot of people, whether through business or through health or just anxiety, stress, it broke people. Yeah. And the other way, I'm, and you and I, were, we're both writing books during this time, ready to share our, share our gifts with people. Yeah. So it's, and I think it goes back, Chris, really it does. It goes back the lineage, your background of who you are, the makeup of who you are and the wisdom you've gained. And then it's a share out time to when you write a book, like mm -hmm. this is my, what I've learned in my, I don't know, 50 years that you've been on this earth, I'm pretty close, maybe 55. Yep. <laughs> there you go. 55 years on this earth. And you could, you could do a share out and, and help people in more than just, it's about, it's not about you anymore. It's about fulfillment and what you can and share to others. Right. So, yeah. And, and you're right. It's, we all have opportunities and I talk a little bit about that in the book, but we all have opportunities when presented with situations, right? We all have choices that we can make good, better, and different. And one of the things that I really liked was um, one of the quotes that I found, it, it talked about how we, we think we, we, we regret some of the things that we did in our past. Right. And then we go, if I could go back and just change that, and what we fail to realize is if we go back to change that, we also change who we are today because we take away the experience that we have, right? And so yeah. there's, there's all those things. I, I grew up in a single parent household. Would I change that? It'd be nice if I grew up in a two parent household, but I didn't. And so guess what? You make the most of it. Or like you said, you kind of, you die as a result of it and, and die metaphorically, right? Internally, emotionally, physically there's things that happen to you and you just, you can shrivel up or you can grow from it. And I'd like to think that eventually I took advantage of it and I learned from those things and I'm 
at a point, like you said, where I get to share this now and I get to the opportunity to give to other people. Yeah, no, that's perfect. I think this is a perfect stopping point for a recess because you you led me down the one of my questions actually that I wanted to ask. So if in the word regret, for some reason, that, that word came up a lot um, in podcasts I was listening to and then actually Jordan Peterson um, had just a, a great video about it as well. So do, do you have any regrets in your life? No, because again, if I look back at the things that I did, do, did I do some things wrong? Absolutely, I did. And did I make some mistakes along the way? Absolutely. And, and we've all heard it and we continue to hear things like this. If you're not failing, you're not growing. And so we get the opportunity to see the mistakes that we make and grow from them, right? And so hopefully we do. So do I regret something? No, not really. You know, and I, I wouldn't go back and change anything either. Do I feel bad about the, some of the things I did? Absolutely. Right. Did I make some mistakes? Absolutely. It'd be great if I would have learned some of the lessons I needed to before, but I didn't. And so here I am. Well, I think that's, for, I, you only learn by failing and mm -hmm. going through struggles, going through setbacks. And then hopefully what I always say, like growth really occurs when you stop doing those things that are hurting you or others. That's when the growth happens. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you another question since we're in the recess session from the, for our interview, if you could pick anyone to sit down for dinner for one night, whether dead or alive, who would it be and, and why? Oof, man. See, that's tough because there's always people that you'd like to sit down and have a conversation with. And for me, I, I, I look at, like I said years ago, I'd love to sit down and have a conversation with Billy Joel. Loved his music, yeah. just wanted to pick his brain for a minute, right? Just where did you get this from? I, I would do the same with Simon Sinek today. Um, I, I love listening to Simon Sinek and, and would love to just sit down with him for 30 minutes. You, There are so many people like that right now that I look at. And I mean, obviously you can look back at history and go, I, I, I'd love to sit down with Lincoln. I mean, I grew up in, in his home state, yeah. right? Or well, actually yeah. the land of Lincoln, but he grew yeah. up in Kentucky. Don't get me wrong, sorry. Yeah. He was born in Kentucky, moved to Illinois. But yeah, I mean, I, I look at that too. And I think, man, what a great, what a great opportunity to sit down and, and again, have a conversation with him. So it, you know, that, that question, John is so difficult because I also look at, um, I, I look at somebody like my stepdad, who was my business mentor and, you know, to have another conversation with him, right. To pick his brain about some of the things that have been happening since he died. And you know, just where things are at, or even talk about my business today, right? Where I am versus where I was and all of these other things. So, yeah, I mean, there's so many different people that I could pick from. And, and so to say one, man, that's, I don't know that I could do that. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, it's, it's like, what was your last, what, what meal would you want last if you were, that, that was it tomorrow, you don't get a meal. That I'm not asking. It doesn't, it, yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah. To me, it's not. <laughs> Yeah. A, I mean, yeah. It's good. Well, you know, it's funny. What it tells me is that um, you're not really stuck on one person that you would want to talk to. But when you brought up these, like Billy Joe, Simon Sinek, um, and then Abraham Lincoln, by the way, that probably would be one of my people that I would want to talk to as well. Um, just to pick his brain, geez, it would be It'd be amazing. I'd, I'd want it to be a whole day conversation, not just dinner. If I could, right, right. You know, but you know, it just tells me that, you know, you're well-versed and, and you're not just, um, not just business only, you know, you're thinking wisdom. You're thinking, you know, Billy Joel, same thing. Like I'm a big Billy Joel fan too. You know, Uptown Girl, one of my favorite songs growing up back in the eighties and it, it just flashbacks. So, yeah. you know, Chris, it's, you know, you did a good job. You passed that, that part. We got one more question though. Okay. Nice. And this one, okay. this one's going to lead into your book very well is, um, what, what vision do you have, um, before you leave this earth? What, what's one vision that you want to accomplish? I'm doing it. Nice. I'm doing it. I literally, I'm doing it. Yes. And the, the cool thing about it is, I think we all want to have some sort of an impact. Well, I, I shouldn't say that. I think a lot of people want to have an impact, whether it's locally, regionally, or globally, right? 
Mm -hmm. And that's what I love about Simon Sinek. Simon Sinek, uh, you know, he has a global perspective. I'm more regional. I'm more, you know, I'm, I'm more pocketed type of person. And it doesn't mean that I can't affect people globally. It just means that I'm not looking at it from that perspective. And what I mean by I'm living it is because I wrote this book, now I get to what I thought was something that would be, oh, this would be cool if a hundred people hundred people picked it up. I'm looking at hundreds of people now and, and potentially thousands. And that's what I'm looking at is I'm looking at going, holy mackerel, this could touch people's lives. Mm -hmm. And it's not that the whole book hits you in the face and it goes, oh man, this is a great book overall. I want you to pick up one thing. I want you to pick up two things. If you get 10 things out of it, man, that's a I, icing on the cake, you know, and you just keep digging deeper and deeper and, and maybe you get more out of it. And that, that'd be my hope is that you would, you know, that somebody would pick this up and go, yeah, there's, there's more than one or two things, but if you get one thing out of it, that to me, that's impact. That's I, I've, in a sense, I've done my job, so to speak. That's well put because I feel the same way um, as an author now as well. And it's nice to have this conversation because we're at the same place. I mean, literally just <laughs> hit, you know, we're, it's it's crazy to think that um that our paths cross like this and then this this interview is taking place and you know I, I would love to have you on a year from now and just to talk about our experiences of how the book's done how the impact it's had but the, we, one thing that resonated really well with me is is that you said you know what if someone got just one to one takeaway from my book, then it, it was worth it. And I thought this, I thought the same thing when I wrote my book, Chris, you know, I just thought to myself, like, if someone were to read it, and that's why I put action steps in each, each of my chapters was, I know you're not going to do every single thing that I'm, I'm doing in my life. But maybe yeah. that one thing that you start doing changes the trajectory of how you are operating in life, and you become a better human being for those around you at work for your family and you know how powerful that is that's powerful that yeah, that's that, huge that that book could have changed someone's life and you know what i know this i'm gonna tell you this straight i'm just a straight shooter your book will not only change one life it'll change hundreds if not thousands and that knowing that is it's just a blessing to know that you are getting fulfilled and you just said that what I loved about you said your vision is you're living it. And I feel the same way about in my life as well. Um, I could go in a little deeper of what I, I have a vision to, to finish in my life, but yep. what but you're you're being you're being an influencer in a positive way more than just um, being um, in a box of just being a coach or, or mm -hmm. having the HVAC background. You're stepping outside of your comfort zone and right. doing something that you feel recently compelled to do. So let's dive into your book and kind of, you said two years ago, you started writing it and just start from maybe either that point or somewhere around that point when you started writing. Sure. The book. So I'd always had this vision that I wanted to write a book. I mean, I've been a coach and trainer for a number of years and my first taste, if you will, of, of coaching and training really came in the mid nineties when I got the opportunity to become a um, mid to late nineties, when I became a, a trainer for a corporation and that I was working for at the time. And, and I really love that. I really love that piece of it to be able to share the knowledge and see people kind of get that aha moment and go, this is how you do it. And watching them become better than me, right? It wasn't about me doing great things. And, and I thought I learned that early on. Well, so I get to this point where I'm like, I just, I know I want to write a book. I just don't know what about, I don't think that I have this super interesting life. And so this, you know, the tell all doesn't do anything for me. And yet we, so my, my, I mentioned my stepdad was my mentor and he passed away in 2016 and he was the previous owner of this chair. Hmm. And this is, you know, he grew up in an, in an era where this was his place. When he came home, this is where he sat and he watched the evening news and maybe he had dinner, or, you know, whatever, but this is where he sat. This is, this was his place. My grandfather had one of these, my dad's dad had a red velvet chair. Mm. And so, and I think it's still in the family, but so he, in 2016, like I said, he was my business mentor. And so he passed away while well, the chair went with my mom and, and she held on to it. And eventually my brother, my younger brother needed it. 
because he had a chair like this. It was brown, but it was falling apart, total disrepair. And so I went up to visit my mom, grabbed the chair and some other furniture, brought it over to him in November of 18. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had it and, and lived with it for a while. And then we lost him in September of 19. Mm -hmm. And um, my sister-in-law and my niece and nephew asked me if I would take it because it was too much of a reminder of my brother. And so I said, absolutely. And so now it sits in the corner. I'm, I'm sitting in the corner of my, uh, my master suite. And this is where I go. And this is where I sit. And this is where I meditate and pray and do my readings and have conversations with the previous owners. And so what happened then? So that's in September of 19, we lost him. Fast forward to May of 20. And I get a text from a buddy. We just entered the pandemic. And he sends this, this meme that says, if you're not improving yourself, working on your side hustle or doing something to better your life and, and those around you, you're wasting your time during the pandemic. And I thought, wow. And that was the nudge that I needed to get over the hump and just say, okay, now it's time for me to move forward with this book. And I'd already been reading these type of books. So I was like, you know what, let me do something along these lines and I'll do this and do this. So I have a quote, I have a title, and then I have a challenge at the end of the day you know, each one of the segments. And so I just thought I'm going to write this. And so May of 2020, I started it and I finished in November of 21. And here we are today with a published book. That's, that's, you're bringing, you're bringing back memories of, I call it the awakening for myself. And it's actually in my book in 2019. Um, so something happened. So for you, your brother passed mm -hmm. in 2019, you get the red chair, you start sitting there you have reflection period, the pandemic just happened in 2020. And, and for me, it's very, it's, it's crazy. You said May of 2020, because that's when I broke my first major mental hurdle physically is I ran my first marathon in May of 2020. Wow. So you're bringing like these parallels here. So like for your buddy to send you this meme, well, for me, it was to break a barrier of fear and then go ahead and finish my book, which which really same thing, you know what, Chris, to be, to be blatantly honest, I think I started writing this book in 2019. <laughs> I oh, wow. sketched it out. Yeah. Then um, it transformed and actually it was done in 2020, um, 2021, just like you, mm -hmm. just in the summertime, we had to change the title of it in November and I had to do a rewrite in January of this year. Uh, you know what? And I think, I think let's talk about this a little bit. Sometimes the timing of things happen, they happen for a reason. So during, Absolutely. so tell me a little bit about the process and was there, was there any timing that you were like either frustrated that it was taking long or that the timing was perfect? Let's talk about that for a second. There's all kinds of those. I mean, <laughs> sure. Well, and I mean, you've heard the phrase, you know, tell God your plans and, and watch him laugh, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's one of those things where you go, hey, things will happen when they need to happen. I, I read a book. I don't know when I wrote it. I read it, um, but it's called The Surrender Experiment by Mickey Singer. Mm -hmm. And what a great book, because that taught me to be open to things that happen. And the timing of them is when they, what they need to be in, in, in their time not necessarily my time, but in their time, it's, I wasn't ready for it. I wasn't ready for this relationship. I wasn't ready for this job. I wasn't ready for this promotion. I wasn't ready for dot, 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 right. This home that the kids, whatever we just, sometimes we're just not ready. Sometimes we're forced into being ready. Yeah. Right. And then other times it's just, it kismet, right. It just all comes together and you're like, okay, I've been planning for this. I've been waiting for this. And so, yeah, there were different times when, you know, I remember the first hundred entries I did, they, it's like, they flew, they just flew by. And then I went, oh crap, I got 266 more to write. Yeah. And then I remember hitting the 180 mark, you know, kind of the halfway point. And I remember I started another countdown with a hundred, you know, I had a hundred left. Okay. Only 190. Now I got 70. Now I got 60, you know, and I remember in 
I think it was in October. I really wanted to finish by the end of October. And I, I didn't, I couldn't finish it. I just, things weren't happening. I was, to your point, I was getting frustrated because I was like, I just want to finish it. But the topics weren't coming and the, the inspiration just, it didn't feel like it was there. And so, um, and then some other things happened. And so instead of being done by the end of October, it was almost mid-November by the time I finished. And that was okay because the timing, you know, just was right for this to happen and that to happen. And, and then I was hoping, okay, by the end of March, we'll have this thing out and we're ready to go. It was a, you know, middle end of April before it <laughs> was coming out. It's like, all right, that's okay too. That's, a, and I've got a speaking gig I'm doing in not next week, but the week after, mm -hmm. and I need the books, right? So we've got the books and, and everything's ready. And now I'm doing a talk on the book and all of this stuff comes to, and so it, the timing of it is it's, it's just right. And it's not, it may not be on my schedule and that's okay. It, it's, it's God, it's the universe. It's, you know, all of these things coming together at the right time and the right place. And so these things needed to happen, right? So that these other things could happen too. You know, it's one of my favorite verses that you're just, that always comes to mind when I hear that about timing is it's Proverbs 16, nine in a man's heart, he determines his course, but the Lord provides the steps. And to me, it's like, you could have the vision and the timing of when you want things to happen and your course mm -hmm. uh, timeline. And then God's like, yeah, but it's not going to happen the way I need you to wait a, just a minute, or I need you to speed it up a little bit because I've got yeah. these other things I want you to do too. And, and yeah, it is, it's interesting. And, and like I said, that book, the, the surrender experiment, when you, when I read that for me, it was like the, the light bulb went off and I was like, okay, I need to be open to these things, but I also need to manifest what I need to manifest and manifesting it is really just preparing yourself, right? And setting things up and having conversations and doing the things that you need to do, right? And, and writing the book, you know, all of those things need to, to be set in place. And that's how you manifest things to come to you. And one of the things I've learned is that number one, we have to be ready, right? But um, when we're ready, we can manifest the things that we need. And that's a very powerful statement. If you think about it, we can manifest the things that we need. And it's not the, well, I wish I had a million dollars. No, it's the, I need to have a conversation with so-and-so I want to have a, you know, to your point, right? Who could I have dinner with? Mm -hmm. Well, who do you want to have a dinner with? Do you want to have dinner with Simon Sinek? Send him an email, right? Mm -hmm. Talk to his people. Well, I know people who know him. I mean, personally, him, John Maxwell, right? Some, I've had conversations with these people and I'm like, I could probably get an introduction if that's what I really want to do. Do I really want to do that, right? And so it starts to ask the question, what do you want to manifest in your life? What's important to be for you to be doing that can make an impact, at least in my eyes, so. So it sounds like the passion, I, I just, the passion you have exudes, over the zoom waves here. <laughs> and what I love about it is you, you just, you're talking about just, um, to me, what I'm hearing is intentionality. If, mm -hmm. if you're intentional about what you want and your discipline to it, then the results will follow. So yeah. tell me, I am going to ask two questions before we, for, before we end, what was the drive of the, of the daily discipline? Like when you got up every day, and you're looking at the calendar of like, man, I still got 180 left or 200. Like what, what was it? What was the, the fire on your belly every day? So a year ago, a little over a year ago, I got COVID mm. pneumonia mm. and I was in the hospital for a week. And when I finished up with that, I, I met with somebody through um, this thing called lunch club. It's, it's a networking type of thing. Mm -hmm. And so I met with this guy and we were talking and he's an author. And, and I said, you know, what is it that inspires you? And he said, I was challenged to get up 30 minutes earlier every single day and just write. And I said, Oh, what a great idea. And I thought, why am I not doing that? And so I started getting up, um, at least 30 minutes early. I just, I set my clock every day. I've got to have at least 30 minutes to do this. And so some days it was 30 minutes. Some days it was two hours wow. that I was able to sit and just read and write and, and, you know, get inspired and, you know, just let that stuff come out. And so that, um, 
I don't know why I just blanked on the question you asked. Me. Well, you were you were you were <laughs> no, you were doing Chris. But you were going along. You were telling about your experience of having yeah. COVID, and then speaking with this author. And yeah. Having, so what inspired me? Sorry. Yeah. yeah. So you were inspired by that. Yeah. That yeah. Kind of so Scott, this guy, this guy I had a conversation with. He he tells me about his sister and the book that she wrote, and I get that book and I read it, and I'm like, what a great book. And what it was a fantastic title. And I can't remember it right now, but Scott's like, yeah, you need to do this. So I did it. And I just was like, you know what, I'm going to do this. And this is my driving force. Now, were there days that I got up and I went, uh, not today. Yeah. But there were days when, hey, I've got a meeting at seven. I got to get up at five, right? I got to, I got to get up early. I got to get up at 430. I got to, and, and I did that purposefully because like you said, with intent, I had the intention that I wanted to get this done. It was, this was not just some daydream. This was not just a, well, if I write it, I write it. No, it, it quickly became, I need to do something with this. And the more I shared it with people, the more people were like, this is, you got something, mm -hmm. do something with it. Right. And so I did. It's a beautiful story because all of us have a story to tell. It's, but the ones that get told are the ones who have actually the discipline to do it. Mm -hmm. or the or, or overcome a fear to speak to people and what i love about what i'm hearing chris is that you know the seed was planted you know you had these losses in your life your, your stepfather and your brother and it makes you and then you have having covid i mean you're you're thinking about death you know mm -hmm. you're thinking about what am i going to offer people what can i offer people besides mm -hmm. just my daily operation of business mm -hmm. And you got the red chair. And I believe this is me personally, what I'm hearing is, you know, God gave you this chair to say, you know what, I want you to sit, reflect, mm -hmm. and now I want you to do my will. And my will for, I mean, this is God's will for you was to write your book because you, you have definitely, I mean, what I'm, what I've been reading so far, definitely an impact in people. And like you said, and we both said this, you have just that one takeaway that could change someone's life. Boom. It was all worth the sacrifice you had made on a daily basis to just wake up early. Think about that for a second. All you have to do is wake up early, get in the state of flow. It's not going to be there every day, but you're doing the work. And when you do the work, the results come, but the fulfillment, this is the best part. The fulfillment is what's happening now. And that's mm -hmm. what you're saying. You're living out your vision is because yeah. you're being fulfilled by sharing your stories in these, this red chair experience to others. And then people are going to write to you and be like, you know what, Chris, you know, May 25th hit me. It was just in there going to send a picture to you and be like, I'm so thankful that you wrote that day. Cause I needed that more than ever. Yeah. And you're going to be like, wow, like, this is what I, this is what I was looking for. That, yeah. that fulfillment piece. So, man, that's awesome. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm so proud of you. I mean, I just I, I just love to see people who just stick to it. And for you, and this is for everyone to hear, is like to write a daily, let's call it, you know, your, your inspirational dailies. Mm -hmm. um, that's hard to do. And I, I've written 40 days of devotional. And I'm like, you, you start thinking like, what else can I add to this so that people can get you know, get meat out of it, not just a little bit of <laughs> the icing on the cake. We want it all. So, I mean, to you, kudos to you for your effort and, and being in the state of flow and just allowing your, um, I keep using that word discipline, but it, it is, and you know, yeah. it, you know, yeah. and that comes from a work ethic and, and a, a vision of what you want to become a reality. So, so this is what I'm going to, I'm going to ask before I, uh, how people can reach you sure. is, you kind of you kind of explained this already um but like i always go to i call it the rocking chair experience so we're we're in your you're in your 80s you know god bless you if you're get to your 90s mm -hmm. um or even at 100 100 mark wow that'd be amazing. nope <laughs> i'm good let's say 80s and 90s i'm good, I'm good. yeah <laughs> and, and you're you're just you're just sitting in this rocking chair and, and you know you're sitting by a fire and your grandkids are there and, and they ask you like, Hey, grandpa, like, you know, can you tell me a story or, or something cool that you did in your life? What, what is it? 
What's that one thing or that story that you would want to poem? I know I'm giving you good questions today. No, you can't. Yeah, you, <laughs> you keep trying to narrow me down and I can't. You, you can't. For me, it's not one story because there's not there's not one. You know, it, it depends, to, to be real honest. Yeah. Where are they at? What's going on? What are they going through? What what would be an impactful story or, or something relevant to them? Right. Um, I have a grandson right now. He's just over a year old now. He he literally was born right before I went into the hospital COVID. Really? Wow. Yeah. And so, and yeah, and unfortunately a month before we had lost my dad. Oh. Um, so, you know, I, you talked about adversity and all these other things. Yeah. yeah. There's just a ton of things that went on and it's like, you know, things you don't do, you don't quit a job, you don't move, you don't get divorced. You don't, you yeah. know, have a death in the family, a birth in the family. Right. I mean, all of these things happen in this, in this time frame. And oh, by the way, then I start writing a book. Yeah. So, so I, I laugh at that. I have to laugh at that. But going back to your question, you know, if I'm sitting there with my, my grandkids or great grandkids and we're sitting there having a discussion and grandpa, you know, what is it? What's the one thing, you know, it really just depends. You know, it could be the, you know, I played football and I followed my dreams. And, you know, even when I was told I couldn't, um, I got to write a book that impacted hundreds and thousands of people and you know they got a takeaway from it and and you get you know it's your legacy now right it, you get that as a part of you know what's going on or what's happening and so yeah i mean there's there's all kinds of things right that i would love to be able to share with him or her and you know what's going on and so yeah i look forward to it well you know what the greatest part is that you have maybe more books to write um more uh opportunities to share more campfire stories <laughs> with your family later down yeah. the road because really to me and I, we're very similar i always say we're cut from the same cloth is that yeah we, we're visionaries we're hardworking people and what we want to do in life is we want to influence people in a positive way to help yeah. change their life because people don't write a book i mean most people don't write a book especially these type that we've written without having an impact and um sharing our journeys right and, I, and I, I like i said i just go back to what you're leaving you're leaving your mark for people and through the adversity you went through like out of that that storm you you birthed a beautiful book for people to understand that and there's so much in here that i have and i wish you could talk more about it but I, i'm taking it day by day and i think that's the way you would probably you know you probably prefer people to take it it's really up to you. Yeah. I I've got a friend of mine who he got it the other day and he's like, I'm through January. I'm like, okay, you're reading it like that. And he goes, yeah, this, I want to read it that way. I'm like, okay, it, whatever you choose. Absolutely. He goes, there's just so many things. And I said, well, mark it up, highlight it, you know, underline it, do whatever. I said, it's, it's really your experience. It's, it's what you get out of it. And if you choose to sit down and read it over a week or a weekend, good for you. It's 400 pages. Yeah, that's, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> but, but that's all inclusive, right? That's, that's the, in that's the intro. That's the mm -hmm. index. That's everything. But yeah, I mean, there's a lot there and it's, it's not necessarily meant to be read in one sitting or two or three sittings. It's really meant to be a, 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 a choice morsel, right. And, you know, getting back to the biblical, right. It's, it's a, this is your opportunity to have a choice morsel and what are you going to do with it? Yeah. And some days it's going to be sweet and some days it's going to be bitter. And some days you're going to be like, eh, not today. I'm not hungry. And that's okay. And I, I even wrote that in the introduction. It's like, I, I want people to, to be able to pick this up at any time and go, and I need a little inspiration. I need a little something. And, and maybe today is not the day that's okay, but don't just let it gather dust, pick it up and, and check it out. It's, it's there for you to read. It's there for you to check out. Yeah, well, that, perfect, hey, perfect segue into what we were talking about is how can how can people reach you uh, to get more, uh, more Chris Michelle, they need more of the, of the red chair experience. So go ahead and tell everybody. Sure. Well, if you want an autograph signed copy of the book, go to the red chair and it'll take you straight to my page and you can go ahead and order your book right there. Or you can get it on Amazon. But um, if you go to coach Chris consulting, that's my website for my business. And love to have a conversation if you're interested in getting some coaching or you need some help with your sales or your business. 
and you're in the home services, plumbing, electrical, HVAC, mm -hmm. roofers, all that stuff. If you, if you just want some help, give me a call. Well, I appreciate it, Chris. Hey, you know what? I love your story. I love the journey of your life. Um, you have so much more to do. You're still a young man at 55. And before you get to that rocking chair moment that I've already pictured for you, <laughs> there's so much more for you to offer in coaching and, and writing more books and, and to influence people around this world. So I'm blessed to have you on the show. Um, I'm thankful that we got connected through our, both of our publishers, Dominic Damaski. And, um, you shout know, out to Dominic. Yeah, shout out to Dominic, our boy. And you know what, Chris, it really, it truly was a pleasure to have you on today. And I look forward to our relationship building um, through the future and for, for us to um, just continue to positively impact people. So absolutely. Thank you so much for having me on. It's great to be here. Thank you so much. And this ends the experience on the John Gardena classroom. And this class is dismissed. So hold on there. We're, we're good on this.